All right, we come to our next book in our Route 66 series. We come to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus, some think about it as the cookbook of the Old Testament. Or maybe you think about it as uh, that section that you have to hit agree to on the license and agreement contracts uh, when you're uh, signing up for something new or you're updating your phone and you get this super long uh, list of legal language and you have to agree to it and nobody really reads it and they just hit agree. We don't know what we're signing off to. And I think a lot of people handle the book of Leviticus that way. They just hit agree and move on. Uh, Others think about it as the Bermuda Triangle of the Old Testament uh, because so many people get lost here in their Bible reading. One writer said that it is perhaps the most neglected of the neglected biblical books. Uh, And yeah, this is a massively important book. It is so significant to us understanding rightly uh, the New Testament as well as other parts of the Old. So it, it is vital to our understanding. Uh, here's a couple introductory quotes. One writer said this, Merrill Unger. He said, Genesis is the book of beginnings, Exodus, the book of redemption, and Leviticus, the book of atonement and a holy walk. In Genesis, we see man ruined. In Exodus, man redeemed. In Leviticus, man cleansed, worshiping, and serving. Someone else uh, kind of sought to put the the books of the Torah uh, into little statements to help us remember. And they said Genesis is about God's rule and reign. Exodus about God's redemption. And then Leviticus is about God's requirements. And Numbers, God's refining. And then Deuteronomy, God's regulations, uh, as it shows us Israel's constitution. Uh, Here's another um, writer, R.K. Harrison, and his commentary on Leviticus. He says, Leviticus is thus a work of towering spirituality, which through the various sacrificial rituals, points the reader unerringly to the atoning death of Jesus, our great high priest. An eminent 19th century writer once described Leviticus quite correctly as the seedbed of New Testament theology. For in this book is to be found the basis of Christian faith and doctrine. The epistle to the Hebrews expounds Leviticus in this connection and therefore merits careful study in its own right. Since, in the view of the present writer, it is preeminent as a commentary on Leviticus. So there are the authors connecting Leviticus and the New Testament book of Hebrews. Uh, Knowing Leviticus is is so important, it's really like learning grammar for the rest of the Bible. You know, in school you learn grammar. Grammar even just is like the basic principles of any subject. Um, and that's what we should think about Leviticus as. It's, it's the basic grammar. I've used the illustration, I think, already in our series that the Torah really gives us the basic, uh, basic math, and then later writers, we're going to uh, combine things, and it's going to be more complicated math. Well, this is another illustration from schooling that you need basic grammar to uh, really understand things in the future, more complex things, and appreciate it. So that's what we have with Leviticus. Um, Uh, One uh, book on Bible survey said this, it took God only one night to get Israel out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. Now, we might even argue with that, that it was still a part of them. But uh, we see here, um, God uh, had them build a tabernacle in Exodus, and yet Israel is a sinful people. In fact, just getting them out of Egypt is not enough. They, they really have a spiritual problem as well. Uh, it's been said that you can't just take Israel out of Egypt. You need to get the Egypt out of Israel. Uh, so uh, this book is going to help them learn about how do sinful people approach and live among a holy God. That is really significant for the book of Leviticus. Uh, Really, it is a book about God's holiness. That is the major theme of this book, holiness. Uh, Forms of the word for holy occur 152 times in Leviticus, more than any other book in the Old Testament. The key verse would be chapter 19, verse 2, which says, You shall be holy, for Yahweh your God is holy. For I, Yahweh your God, am holy. 
And it comes up a number of other times. You shall be holy for I am holy. Chapter 11, verse 44. We just read chapter 19, verse 2. Chapter 20, verse 7. And verse 26 as well. Uh, The book of Leviticus is, um, the Greek title uh, is, Leviticus means like pertaining to the Levites, pertaining to the Levites, which yes, there's a lot about priests in here, but it's actually for the whole nation. So maybe not uh, fully grasping the whole book. The Hebrew title is really like we've said already. Um, It comes from some of the first words in uh, the book. And so the book is really, uh, it starts out in the, I'm reading from the LSB, then Yahweh called. And so the book is, and he called, and he called. <laughs> that's, the, that's the name of this book. Um, we, we see, when, it, when is this happening? These things happen while Israel is camped at Mount Sinai. And so really, if you're going to date this, it's about 30 days potentially that they're um, receiving these instructions. Here's one writer's attempt at getting at a purpose statement for the book. Uh, They say, quote, Yahweh gave instruction that enabled him to live among his chosen people and enabled his people to have fellowship with him. And once again, we ask the question, how can God live among a sinful people? Uh, This idea of holiness is the the main theme of the book. Uh, That's what you should think about when you come to Leviticus. But uh, holiness, what does that mean? What is holiness? And there's really two concepts that we could talk about when we think about holiness. Um, we probably most readily think about the idea of what we'll call moral holiness. It, it's uh, moral purity, moral separateness in that regard. But there's a more fundamental idea uh, of which the moral idea is actually secondary. The, the fundamental idea of holiness is what we might call majestic holiness. And the idea of majestic holiness is the idea that God is other. He's different. He's, uh, we might say, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy other, and in his holiness. So he is separate from his people, and that has implications. And one of those implications is that he is morally separate as well. And so there's that moral aspect. And so how can a sinful people dwell with a holy God? Well, if we were to look about an outline for this book, think about an outline for this book, um, there is a very simple one that I think is, is quite helpful. It breaks the book into two parts, chapters 1 to 17. We might call it sacrifice, and this describes the way to God. In chapters 18 to 27, we would call this sanctification, and this is the walk with God. So the way to God and the walk with God, sacrifice and sanctification. And of course, we can divide this under uh, different subsections as well. Uh, Let me just give you those, and then I'll kind of come up with a a more memorable way to break these down. But you can think about um, the sacrificial system is really given in chapters 1 to 7. Then you have the ministry of the priesthood in chapters 8 to 10, as they're really set apart and ordained for that work and ministry. Uh, You have the laws for purification of clean and unclean in chapters 11 to 15. Then you have the Day of Atonement, which is a very significant holiday for Israel. And then you have, uh, after that, in chapters 17 to 24, different covenant ordinances, how they're to live, um, and then you and including their calendar and the different things that are to, cel- uh, to, to, to uh, celebrate and uh, govern their, their year. And then you have um, covenant, uh, or you have the year of Jubilee in chapter 25. And then covenant blessings and curses, chapter 26. And then there's kind of this appendix at the end of uh, vows, making vows and promises in chapter 27. Um, we're going to generally follow that. I'm going to, that's just kind of a more bland uh, explanation of these sections. I, I'm going to, I alliterated it for us here as we kind of break these down. So we're going to use these major headings of sacrifice and sanctification, and then we'll fill it in underneath. So, First, we're, let's start with sacrifice, the way to God in chapters 1 to 17. And the first section is chapters 1 to 7. And we'll call this the requirement of sacrifices. The requirement of sacrifices. And here's really the, it's actually quite easy to follow. God is giving the various um, sacrifices. So in, there's a kind of a prescript in verses 1 to 2. Let's read that. 
It says, Then Yahweh called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man from among you brings an offering near to Yahweh, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or the flock. And then what proceeds is God describing how you're to offer these different kinds of offerings, okay? So you have first the burnt offering, which starts in verse 3 to verse 17. And then you have the grain offering, which is in chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. It's all of chapter 2. Then you have the peace offering, which is chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Then the sin offerings, in chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, verse 13. Then the guilt offerings, chapter 5, verse 14 to 6, verse 7. And um, and then you really have kind of a, a postscript in chapter 7 through 37 to 38. And you're thinking, well, what about the rest of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7? Well, essentially what happens is in chapters 1 to 5, God gives these five different offerings and how they're to be regulated. And then he gives them again in chapter six and seven. And you think, why why again? Well, because in chapter six and seven, it's more directed towards the priests. Chapters one to five is to the people in general, but chapter six and seven, the same sacrifices are described in relationship to the priests. Why, why, Why do you have that? Well, because the people need to know about what they're to offer, but the priests also need to know how they're to function in regulating this system. So you have these regulations and requirements for these sacrifices. And so uh, the burnt offerings in the priest side is found in chapter 6, verses 8 to 13. The grain offerings, chapter 6, verses 14 to 23. The peace offerings, chapter 7, verses 11 to 36. The sin offerings, chapter 6, verses 24 to 30. And the guilt offerings, chapter 7, verses 1 to 10. So that's really, you have them repeated again. So we can cover this whole section in one. So what is the message, though, of Leviticus 1 to 7? Well, it's really, in a sense, good news. God has provided a means for sinners to worship before him, uh, to enter his presence. And uh, we have these five major offerings, and then you have uh, the, the, uh, the priests and the people, or first the people given instructions, then the priests to administer them. Now, here's something that we must deal with early on here that is somewhat of a, a common way people think about this. Um, we have to recognize as we look at these sacrifices that they're uh, these offerings rather that they're not all related to sin. I think we th- we're often inclined to think that all the sa- all the offerings um, are related to sin. They're not. So, uh, in fact, three of them are just to- related to worship in general. Uh, two of them are focused more directly about sin, and that's actually helpful to make that distinction because if we go wrong in understanding the. Uh, different offerings here, we will get confused and maybe make some missteps later in the Old Testament in books like Ezekiel and other places as well and understanding some of what's going on there. So that's important for us to understand. Now, I heard it explained to me this way, and it's memorable. It stuck with me. Maybe it'll help you as well. Um, that when you think about these five uh, sacrifices, you can think about how each one of them represents something. It's trying to teach us some truth. It's trying to teach Israel some truth about how to approach God, how to worship God. And so there's a lesson within each of these. And so if you can learn the lesson, it actually makes the reading of these much more profitable for you instead of like, "Uh, I'm not going to have to do any of these. But you start to see what the theology behind them uh, is, is, uh, what the theology being taught is behind these. Um, but here's what was explained to me. You can think about a restaurant, and maybe this is not as helpful for us in South Georgia, but um, in California, you have the restaurant In-N-Out, and they have a pretty small menu. And uh, But you, there's a, there's, In-N-Out's notorious for having a secret menu. Things not, not on the menu publicly, but you can order things. And really, it's like a mix and match of different ingredients. And so if you were to think about uh, customizing your order, uh, you'd have to know what the, what the basics are, and then you can customize an order in the secret menu. Well, um, you can take those limited ingredients and make a a unique, you know, dish. 
that's somewhat of a helpful way to think about the five uh, offerings here, because depending on how you mix and match them, you're getting a different theological message. And uh, in fact, even if you do all of them together in one day, that communicates something in particular. So uh, let's just walk through these and see how uh, what they are initially, and that'll help us for later when we see about thinking about mixing and matching them uh, on the secret menu, if you will, just to keep that illustration, and how that will teach us lessons for later. So first, we have the burnt offering, the burnt offering. Now, what is the burnt offering? Well, it is the whole offering is burnt. So really complicated here. <laughs> and what does that show? Well, it shows one's dedication to God. It's as if it's all burnt to the Lord. So you want to be completely dedicated to the Lord. And um, we see uh, in verse Three of chapter one, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall bring it near a male without blemish. He shall bring it near to the doorway of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before Yahweh. Uh, And he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. Now, uh, that word atonement is is interesting as well. We're actually going to make some more comments on it later, but it may very well be here that it's simply speaking about consecration, this idea of consecration of oneself uh, and not so much dealing with sin necessarily. The term uh, atonement seems to have a broader range of meaning uh, in the Old Testament than it does in the New Testament, Uh, but we'll get there in a moment. So that's the burnt offering. It is a complete dedication to the Lord. Secondly, you have the grain offering. Uh, so you have grain that was cultivated uh, in the land. And so this is a way to bring this to the Lord, to show thanks to the Lord, how he's given you um, these things and provided for you. And so this is, not, this is a bloodless uh, offering, uh, this grain. Then you have the peace offering. This is also called the fellowship offering. And this is the idea that you're thanking God for the relationship that you have with him. And here's what's uh, interesting about this offering. The, the one who offers this the animal that they bring, they actually uh, share a meal with the priest before God. And uh, and so there's this fellowship meal that takes place. You eat it together. Now, think about this in contrast to the burn offering. You burn up all of the burn offering, and here you have some of the meat to eat, and so you share. And so it's this idea of this relationship. Uh, It is showing that there's peace, and so then you have fellowship. And so that's a great picture there of, of what we have. Um, that we have peace with God. We, we now are, uh, God's wrath has been dealt with and we have peace with God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a relationship with him. Um, now the last two have to do more explicitly with sin. Uh, but even these, uh, like the sin offering, it can be used to cleanse a, uh, an altar, which the altar didn't sin. So at times it can relate to things that are just related to consecration as well. But in the sin offering, the high priest, um, he would bring an animal, and here's some great imagery here. He would lean on, um, especially on the Day of Atonement, he would lean on the animal and place his hands on the animal and confess sins. And so there's some great imagery here. The idea is by leaning on the animal, he puts his weight upon the animal, and the animal is somewhat as the representative of um, Uh, representative for the person and shows the reliance and trust upon that sacrifice. Leaning your weight shows a reliance, a a trust, as well as representation. And so the animal then bears the weight of the sin, the guilt of sin. And when the animal is killed, God's, um, the idea is that uh, God is pleased with that. Uh, There is a penalty and justice and wrath involved. Uh, You're killing something in the place of another. And, um, and so it tells you something about God's holiness. So the priest uh, would then offer the animal as a, as a burnt offering or attain part of the animal as a peace offering. So uh, after you kill the animal, uh, your uh, sins are, are dealt with. God's wrath is ended, but now it is not just about removing sin, but about being right with God. And that's that idea uh, of justification. We are declared uh, just not only um, innocent, but we're righteous, but we have peace with God, Romans 5.1. Um, so we start to see just there's some beautiful theological lessons in the process and the principles being laid down here, teaching Israel. Uh, and these are really strict rules for the worshiper and the priest. That it's to be done in God's way. Uh, fifth, we have the guilt offering, the guilt offering. And what is the difference between the guilt and the sin offering? 
Well, the guilt offering, it includes times when restitution needs to be made. It's, for instance, if you defiled the sanctuary in some way, you would need to do something to restore the consequences of that. Or uh, times when repentance deals with how you've sinned against God or your neighbor and uh, your sin has affected them in some way needs to have restitution. It's interesting that in Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant, it, it refers to him as offering himself as a guilt offering. And so this is the idea of he deals with not only sin, but also its consequences. And so once again, these five offerings teach a theology uh, through a hands-on picture. And these will ultimately find their climax and consummation and completion in um, uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ, these offerings for sin. Now, what is this system for? God is giving Israel a system here a system, a way of approaching him. And the system really at this point serves as, uh, as like a pop-up book. You know, a kid's pop-up book, you open it up and it's, things open up and you can see real clearly. And in a way, that's what this system is. It is to teach them important lessons. And, here, and this is why this is important because the sacrifice of animals could not uh, save anyone ultimately. And here's the illustration that many of you used. That it's, I think it's just brilliant. It's so helpful to remember how this works. How does the system work? Well, it's like the difference between a credit card and a debit card. A credit card and a debit card, right? So using a credit card, um, you, are, you go into the store, you pick out an item, you take it to the desk at the counter, you, you hand them a piece of plastic, now you just tap it, and then you walk out with that possession, now, you actually didn't give them any money. You, you, you haven't paid, in other words, uh, but you have made a commitment to pay. But yet you get to experience the benefits of uh, having that possession. And what is the agreement, though? It is the agreement that one day that uh, bill, when it comes in the mail, you will pay it. And that's what you're supposed to do. Now, the difference with the debit card is that you have money in the bank already. And when you use the debit card, it, di- it directly takes that money out of the bank. And, uh, and, and so there's no future time at which you're paying that. It's, it's instantaneous. And so this helps us because really what you have in the old covenant system of offerings is that it, it's as, as though when you come with an offering for your sin, you, you are being forgiven. God is pleased with that. And yet... There's been no basis really for how that can take place. It's like you put it on credit and in the future that will be dealt with. In the new covenant, after Christ has come, then now it's like a debit card and there's money in the bank and Christ has paid the the bill from the past. Uh, in In a passage like Hebrews chapter 10, verse four, we read this, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So you're like, well, how, how are they being forgiven? Or how is this happening? Well, it, it, they're looking forward, just like every Old Testament saint, they're looking forward to um, God's future work of deliverance through his Messiah. Uh, that they're looking forward to that. They're looking to the re- revelation that they have at that time. And uh, this system allows them, like a credit card, to benefit from that. And then Christ has dealt with that. Another passage is Romans chapter 3, verse 25. It says, for indeed, circumcision is of value for practice. Sorry, wrong verse. Chapter 3, verse 25. Whom God displayed, he displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation. That's like a wrath satisfying sacrifice in his blood through faith for a demonstration of his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. So God was passing over people's sins, even though they were in the sacrificial system there. uh, uh, For the verse 26, for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So God had to be uh, saving people in a just way. He he had to uh, justify people justly. Uh, in, 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 to, to put it another way. And how does he do that? Well, by Christ dying as the ultimate sacrifice for sins, because it couldn't be through an animal, but that's the picture. It's the credit card. And now we have the debit card. Well, there's many other lessons about the sacrificial system. We think about that the animals can't have any defect. They have to be perfect. Of course, that foreshadows the Lord Jesus's perfection. Um, and uh, that's repeated many times. Um, 
it's also, as we think about new covenant believers and we think about living out our faith and we're to uh, worship God and think about our worship, I think it also would point to the fact that we should not give our the Lord our worst, right? So bring your best. They can't bring their lame animals, uh, the worst ones that they don't care about. They have to bring their best animals. And so God demands our best in worship. We don't bring our leftovers to the Lord. And so that is significant, a significant application for us. What are some implications then for atonement? Atonement. Well, we might say it is powerful. It accomplishes that which it sets out to do. Um, When atonement is made, it is efficacious. It does not need to be activated by us. Uh, There's no potential atonement. And so God's atonement is powerful. It's also propitiating. Atonement is a matter of propitiation, a soothing aroma to God to deal with his anger, his wrath. It's painful also. It's difficult, in in other words. It's messy. It's bloody. Uh, Everyone's getting blood on themselves. Uh, The offer was to kill it. Um, We read in chapter 7, verse 30. Chapter 7, verse 30. His own hands are to bring offerings by fire to Yahweh. He shall bring the fat with the breast, and that the breast may be waved as a wave offering before Yahweh. And so it's not easy. So it is powerful, propitiating, painful. But what is, I mentioned this earlier about atonement and making sure that we don't limit our definition of of atonement unnecessarily. Um, It seems as though the word atonement has a broader range of meaning in the Old Testament than it does in the New. Uh, In the New, we almost, it's almost used exclusively of what Christ has done to cleanse us from sin and give us forgiveness. But in the Old Testament, uh, atonement can refer to cleansing, as in forgiveness of sin. Uh, it can, of course, do that, uh, absolutely. But it can also refer to uh, the idea of like purification, uh, purification of an unclean object or a person who uh, needs to become clean. And so it doesn't necessarily deal with sin and forgiveness. Um, or it can deal with, for instance, you, you know, you have a woman who's being cleansed. From after having a, a baby, that's there's nothing sinful about that, but there's the need for uh, purification. It can refer to consecration, whereby a common object or person is made holy. Uh, the priests are set apart in um, chapters eight and nine, and they are consecrated for their work. It's not necessarily dealing with sin, but it's dealing with their being set apart from common to special use. They are to be priests, the ones who stand before the people and God. And so you have that. You also have, um, there's atonement made for the sanctuary or atonement made for the altar. Now, these are not uh, inanimate objects, can't sin. So the atonement language can, in the Old Testament, refer to objects uh, and and even people and not be related to sin specifically. So that's important because that's going to help us later. These distinctions are very important to grasp especially when it comes to what happens later in Ezekiel 40 to 48 and the millennial temple sacrifices. And you're thinking, why are there sacrifices there? Well, and having these distinctions are actually going to be quite important later when we think about that. Uh, So the priests are, um, okay, let's see here. Um, So not only does God give detailed instruction on how to sacrifice, but also on those who administer the sacrificial system, the priests. And that's really what chapters 8 to 10 are about. And so we could call this the representatives for worship, the representatives for worship. So if chapters 1 to 7 were the requirement of sacrifices, uh, chapters 8 to 10 are the representatives for worship. Who are the representatives? It's the priesthood. This is the ministry of the priesthood. And really you have chapter 8, 9, and 10. In chapter 8, you have the consecration of the priests uh, by Moses here. Then you have um, the commencement of the priesthood in chapter 9 with Aaron. And then you have the condemnation of two priests, Nadab and Abihu, in chapter 10. So what you have in these chapters, chapters 8 to 10 are the setting apart of the priests and the priesthood. Uh, When the priests are consecrated, what they have to do is they have to offer all five sacrifices on one day. 
uh, you might think about it as like their final exam, right? You got to study hard and, and you got to do the five sacrifices together. And so, like we said, you know, the secret menu, what happens when you order all five of the offerings on one day? Well, that would indicate that you have an ordination of a priesthood, the ordination of the priesthood. That's what, that's what those signify when they come together. So that's significant because this might explain why these five are offered in one day in Ezekiel 40 to 48 to show that what's happening is the, the entire nation is now being ordained to the priestly service. Uh, Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests in Exodus chapter 19, and yet they never completely fulfilled that task. Um, And so what you have later in Ezekiel is that God is now finally having Israel to have the, the function of ministering to the nations in a special way as somewhat of a worship leader. But now the entire nation is being set apart as priests. And Isaiah speaks about this, I believe in Isaiah 61 Uh, about Israel, all the people being priests. And so that seems to be what's happening here because you think, oh, wait a minute, all in one day, these five, that tips you off to say something is happening here. It's not related to their sin. They're not being forgiven of sin through these sacrifices, but rather they are being consecrated. They're being set apart as what they were always meant to be. And so it's a beautiful picture there. And so this is why paying attention to the grammar in Leviticus is so important for later in scripture because it helps you to untangle some really challenging gorgeous and knots of theology later on in scripture. So um, these uh, priests were to be representatives before God. And they were the, really the custodians in, in many ways. They were teachers. They were to teach the law. And they were uh, those who handled the sacrifices. Um, so you think, which priesthood is Jesus a part of? Well, he's actually not a part of the Levitical priesthood. He's a part of the Melchizedekian priesthood because you couldn't be a priest from the tribe of Judah. Um, you had to be a priest from Levi. Um, but the king has to be from the tribe of Judah. So how is Jesus a priest and a king in one office, one person rather? Well, he's a king from Judah, but he's of a priesthood of a different line. It's outside of the line of Levi. He's of one that precedes the Levitical priesthood, which is the Melchizedekian priesthood. So that is uh, important for understanding Jesus's work. And the author of Hebrews brings that out, solves that dilemma for us. So Uh, In chapter 10, it's one of those um, few narrative sections in the book. And here's something that is important to notice as you lead up to chapter 10. There's a repeating phrase in chapter 8, verse 4. Chapter 8, verse 4. Here's what we read. So Moses did just as Yahweh commanded him. Just as Yahweh commanded. This is in 8, chapter 4, verse 9, verse 13, verse 17, verse 21, verse 29, chapter 9, verse 7, and chapter 10. Just as Yahweh commanded. And then notice how chapter 10 begins. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and put fire in them. Then they placed incense on it and offered strange fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. Huh. So this should stand out to us as God has said, Moses did just as Yahweh commanded, just as Yahweh commanded. And then they did it, which he had not commanded them. So he, they violate this. This is a um, classic example we know of. Um, we have uh, Nadab and Abihu offering strange fire. Uh, what, what is that? What is strange fire? Well, it's really simply fire that deviates in any fashion from what God has prescribed. God said it had to be done in a specific way. Uh, And the incense had a special mix, a special process. And so it's kind of irrelevant as to some people get real, you know, trying to figure out exactly what it was. The idea is, the basic idea is if you mess up at one step, you're offering strange fire. In other words, someone has put it like this. We are not to be innovative in our worship. God determines how we worship him. And if you get that wrong, then... uh, you become the sacrifice is the idea. That's the idea. It sets up for that important thing. We even talk about that. We say, you know, it, either, either Jesus Christ will bear your sin and you'll be forgiven or you will bear your sin forever in eternity. Either he's your sacrifice or you become the sacrifice. And that's what happened to Nadab and Abihu. They became the sacrifice. 
Uh, I heard someone kind of joke one time. They said, this is the first case of ministry burnout. Yeah, of course. And so God is serious about uh, worship and have, how he is worshiped. You don't get to make it up. You don't get to innovate. You worship him the way that he says. Uh, so they became the sacrifice. Uh, here, here are some principles from the section. You must prepare yourself for worship before God. Uh, that's, that's important. You must prepare yourself. Also, you must perform your worship as God has commanded. You don't get to make it up. We do what God has said. Now, of course, there's differences for us in the new covenant, but nevertheless, we still have instructions on how we are to function in worship. Uh, you must place your faith in the ultimate priest, the Lord Jesus, in the line of Melchizedek. That must be your hope. And you must pursue holiness as the priesthood of all believers. First Peter 2, verse 5 and 9 to 12 uh, speaks about us as a, a holy priesthood in the, in the church. And we are uh, really a uh, first fruits of what will happen for Israel. And so we, we kind of Israel substitute teacher right now in the church. And so, but we are each of us, the priesthood of all believers and we are to be holy. So what have we seen? These are the representatives for worship in chapters 8 to 10. Now we move to the ritual purity in chapters 11 to 15. And these are laws about uh, clean and unclean, clean and unclean, ritual purity or ritual in, uh, cleanliness. And um, you have this concept that is maybe hard for us to understand where you have things that are clean and things that are unclean. And the idea is um, uh, someone had put it like this and I like this. They say, okay, if you uh, don't take a shower uh, for a month, uh, will that affect your spouse and your relationship? Yeah, of course it will. They're not going to want to hug you. They won't want to be around you, right? It's going to affect the relationship because you're stinky, right? And so to think about it like that, that there's this, there's this uh, God is teaching them that there's kind of this separation here with clean and unclean. Um, and some of these things are not even related to committing a sin, but God is just showing them this, this separateness, uh, this holiness that he has here. And so there's this ritual purity. And here's how it breaks down. Chapter 11 has purity regarding food, uh, the foods that they're to eat. Chapter uh, 12 deals with purity related to childbirth. Uh, chapter 13 and 14 deals with purity related to really like infectious diseases. And then chapter 15, uh, purity with regard to personal hygiene. So these um, it, it, it communicate a number of principles. Think about chapter 11, food purity. And... Um, it's really structured around, uh, first you have land animals, chapter 11, verses 1 to 8, then water animals, 9 to 12, flying animals, 13 to 23, clean and unclean carcasses, uh, and then a summary. And uh, this maybe reminds us of uh, the creation week. You have land animals, sea creatures, and, and sky creatures. But why does God divide between clean and unclean animals? Why this animal clean? Why that animal unclean? Uh, of course, later, um, that uh, we're not under this food uh, restriction any longer in the new covenant. But why, why did he choose this? I think, you know, we're not told explicitly, but it, it seems uh, others have pointed out that most likely the idea is that th the animals that they're not allowed to eat relate in some way to the cultures around them to death. Uh, they're, they're, they're related to death and dirtiness, the way the animals are or um, what they eat. And so it, it seems that God is trying to communicate to these nations that, that our God is the God of life and of purity and holiness. And so we, even though it's convenient for us to eat these foods, we will not eat these foods to show you a message, a theological message about our God. And so that seems to, to fit. But even more fundamental than that is God has them eat different because what is something that brings you together with other people? It's eating. It's food. And so God is intentionally separating them and making a distinction for them so that they are intentionally separate from other nations, other peoples, to make them distinct. He wants them to look different. And so uh, that's what we see there in chapter 11, verse 44. Um, we read this. It says, for I am Yahweh your God, therefore set yourselves apart as holy and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that move on the earth. For I am Yahweh who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. And so they're to separate in this way. Now, of course, we, we uh, see the dietary laws are fulfilled and no longer binding in Acts chapter 10. You can read that as Peter is... Uh, 
Peter is there and he, he receives this vision of a sheet coming down with clean and unclean animals. And he says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And God has to tell him more than once. And yet uh, God is teaching him now that as the church, in the church, you have this uh, people that are not to be distinguished. They're, in other words, Jew and Gentile are not to uh, be separated, but to be, there's unity in the church here. And there's freedom now to eat of these foods. And so um, there's nothing uh, wrong inherently with these animals, but God was making a distinction for his people for that season and that time. And now that the old covenant has been fulfilled in Christ, we're not bound by these food laws, though they are instructive to us, nevertheless, as far as the distinctions that are made. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses two to four, we read this, for you are a holy people to Yahweh your God, and Yahweh has chosen you to be a people for his treasure possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You shall not eat any abominable thing. These are the animals which you may eat. And then he goes on and tells them. So not to eat these abominable things, to be different from the other nations. Uh, Another place you can look to see that distinction that God wants them to have is in Leviticus 20, verses 23 to 26. So that's the food laws. Then chapter 12, you have purity with regard to childbirth, related to childbirth. In, um, and really, the male child uh, makes her unclean for one week, and then uh, 33 days after, and then a female child makes her clean for two weeks, and then a further 66 days after that. And what's the difference? Well, the main reason in the text is because the, the son is to be circumcised in the eighth day, and so then there needs to be cleansing for him to uh, be able to be circumcised. And uh, so that seems to be the most logical answer there. Um, but why would she need to be, why would she be unclean from birth? Birth is a good thing. It's a gift from the Lord. Well, likely because of the uh, association with blood. A lot of blood happens in uh, childbirth. And uh, later, there's the significance in chapter 17, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so he, there is this need to have purity. So here is the idea that you you have to make this offering and um, and that is uh, to to be ceremonially clean after this. Um, Jesus' parents fulfill this law in, of Leviticus ten in Luke chapter two, and we actually learn that they were poor because they offer. There's two options, and if you offer these turtle doves, it indicates that you don't have as much, and yet. This is the beauty of God's system is that it's for anyone, rich or poor. If you don't have that much, God still makes provisions for you to offer something, uh, but you're supposed to bring your best. And so even for the poor, that's their best. So that's what we see in chapter 12, chapter 13. We have purity with related to infectious diseases, and it deals with cleansing lepers. And, um, you, you know, you see here, and really, here's what's fascinating. In chapter 13, you have um, how to identify leprosy. And it's kind of a general term for different skin diseases. And um, you, you see that, that he's identifying it. But it, there's no way for them to cleanse it. They can't cleanse it. The law can only reveal what's wrong, but it can't fix what's wrong. And so chapter 13 says, here's how you identify it. Chapter 14 is, here's what you do if someone has been healed of their leprosy. But it actually doesn't. Uh, there's there's a big gap there. It's like, how do you get healed of your leprosy? Well, the law just points out how to identify it and what to do if it's been cleansed. But this is what's beautiful is that Jesus comes along and he heals a leper. And then he tells him to show himself to the priests and they'll know. And I like to think uh, that there, there really was no case uh, where someone in the Old Testament had been healed during the Levitical period and was able to show themselves to the priests. And so this guy's maybe the first one. They have to dig up the old form on how to deal with this. And, and it's a sign that now there's something that the law couldn't do that has been done by this man, by, this, by the Messiah. And we have a new system coming. He is bringing the the kingdom and 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 he's uh, dealing with he's healing it so they have to now use Reve- uh, Leviticus 14 maybe for the first time so it's beautiful there chapter 15 then deals with bodily discharges and really here's the message God is concerned with even the most intimate parts of your life he is concerned about everything and so um there is uh, an importance here. If you think of with eating, you know, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God, the mundane things, even those private matters of these bodily discharges um, are, are important to God and how you deal with it. So everything, the, the mandatory things, the optional things, all of it is important. Holiness in every area of life. That's the idea here. Now, here's something interesting. Uh, I didn't mention back in the different offerings. The offerings in the system only deal with unintentional sins, only unintentional sins. In other words, sins done in ignorance. Uh, 
without prior intent, we might say. But what's interesting is there's really no sacrifice up to this point for intentional high-handed sins. Oh, that's a problem, right? I've committed high-handed sins, uh, intentional sins. And so this is a problem, and God knew it. Um, they're, they're not dealt with. They're not covered. So what do, you, what do you do? Well, you need something more. And so this is what comes, uh, this is why chapter 16 is so important. It's known as the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement. And uh, I've heard it said, this is uh, Sweet 16, Sweet 16. And it's, in, it's the ceremony that deals even with intentional sin. And this is, uh, here's the way to think about chapter 16. We, we're using ours here. So this is the reset, the reset day. And what you have in the uh, Day of Atonement is a reset for Israel. Uh, it's the Great Reset. There's a TV show on uh, years ago I saw in college, and there was a, a, a moment in the show where there was this computer, and they had to type in these specific numbers in the specific order, and uh, every 108 minutes, and they would count down, and then they would have to do it right before it turned, and they hit enter, and then it would reset the, the computer, and you know, it was like to stop, you know, protect something from happening. Well, this is the reset for Israel. It resets the whole system and it just cleanses the whole system. It cleanses the the place itself. It cleanses the people, um, the priest, and it deals with it. And so this is so important. And and so here's the interesting thing though, after the day of atonement, then if you, you start recurring, building up the sin debt again, and it would only happen once a year. The, the high priest and him alone would enter into the most holy place, the inner part of the, the temple or the tabernacle at this point, And he would offer a specific offering and it would uh, deal with this. And so this is the climax uh, and crown, as one person said, of Israel's theology of sanctification once a year. Uh, one person put it like this. You have really in verses 1 to 13, a pure priest, and then in 14 to 34, a pure sacrifice. Uh, there were uh, two goats and then a bull and a ram. And you have this uh, part really where you have lots cast for these goats, and one of them is going to be slaughtered for a sin offering, and the other is going to be sent out. The sins will be confessed on its head and then sent out into the wilderness. This is the, the scapegoat, as we call it. And so it is sent away. And it's this beautiful picture for Israel's forgiveness of sins. Um, The high priest's role really sets up for Christ as our high priest, though through the order of Melchizedek. And of course, in John 9, verse 29, you have the Lamb of God, John the Baptist says, who takes away the sin of the world. So we see here the importance of the Day of Atonement. And it's so significant. It's so important in Israel's history. Um, one writer said this, the instruction regarding the day, the day of atonement prepares for the coming material on holy living. It may be said that the moral and spiritual energy for the people to fulfill the laws in chapters 17 to 26 comes out of their finding complete expiation on the day of atonement. The ritual for the day of atonement thus appropriately stands before the laws on holy living. And so Jesus' sacrifice uh, as a perfect, pure priest only needed to be one time in contrast to the yearly offering of the Day of Atonement. And you can look at the book of Hebrews in chapter 9 and see that. This chapter is also important to show us the dual functions of the priest. The priest was to uh, sacrifice on behalf of the people And he was to supplicate on behalf of the people. In other words, he pays for the people and he prays for the people. And that sets up for what Jesus would do. He would pay for his people's sins and he would pray for his people in particular. And this would propitiate the wrath of God and then he would intercede for them. This is beautiful to study this chapter and so important. The word atonement comes up so many times in this. Um, interestingly enough, uh, going to Ezekiel again, Ezekiel 40 to 48 in this uh, new system, which is not a part of the Mosaic system. It's not a reinstitution of the Mosaic system. It's part of the new covenant and, uh, that, that Ezekiel has already talked about. But one thing that's absent, that's glaringly absent is the day of atonement. There's no mention of the day of atonement. Why? Because Christ has already at that point in history dealt with sin once and for all. And so also indicating to us that those, uh, the, the offerings happening there are not for forgiveness of sins any longer because that's been dealt with. So following the day of atonement are the instructions in chapter 17 on blood and how it's to be handled differently uh, from how the pagan nations would around them. And so chapter 17, we'll call it the regulations for blood, the regulations for blood. 
and uh, it's the importance of the uh, because of and reverence for blood, um, not reverence for blood, but the, the, the holiness uh, of it. The, and here's the idea. Here's the main principle in ch- verse 11 of chapter 17. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you uh, on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. And so the life is in the blood. This is a really a, a symbol. The symbol, blood is the symbol of life. And so to shed blood is to take life which is demanded for atonement. So God wants them to handle blood in a specific way to communicate this message. Well, that's really the first part of the book of Ezekiel, uh, excuse me, of Leviticus. Uh, it deals with sacrifice and the way to God. Uh, in the next uh, lesson, we will pick up and we'll look at the second half of uh, second part of Leviticus and look at sanctification, the walk with God in chapters 18 to 27.